Hello, and welcome to Two Dancing Clamps. This is a Blender 3.4 tutorial for creating a set of geometry nodes to convert a curve into a wall with procedural UV unwrapping. Creating the wall is not the tricky bit. Procedurally unwrapping a curved path so the texture follows the curve is quite tricky. The curve supplied to the geometry nodes can be cyclic or not. This well back here is a, started off as a circle. This wall started off life as a spline. This geometry node group produces high detail, low poly objects. This project can be made to work with previous versions of Blender with one small tweak I'll cover when we get there. The general strategy is to take the curve supplied, which would be this, turn it into this wall shape using a curve to mesh. I'm just using a rectangular object for this example. You could, this uh, profile here could be anything you want. And then we create a rectangular object with the same number of edges, corners, faces. Then we UV unwrap the rectangular object and then copy the UV map onto the curved object. And that produces this UV map, which is quite boring, but in this case, boring is what we want. If you use the simpler approach to UV unwrapping, you get this effect. And this happens because the UV map created is curved and it will pull out a curved section of the texture and apply it to the top of the wall. This is usually not the effect I want. Controls are provided to change the number of resamples on this curve to make it smoother or less smooth. The uh, wall width and height are also adjustable. I've provided scaling for the UV map, and a lot of times this is all you really need to hit is just to tweak it using these values. You can also provide a texture in these three boxes. Now the texture can be the same, but what I prefer to do is to create three identical copies of the same texture and give them different names. Inside the geometry node, the faces are individually identified. They're split into the top and bottom, the front and the back, and the ends. And each texture is applied to just one of those groups. If we go to the shader editor, a dot to show the whole thing, and let's bring up the one for the sides. So if I go in here and I adjust the X location, only the front and the back of the wall are modified. Everything else is left alone. This allows you to get really fine grain control over what's happening with the texture. This is especially important if you care what the texture looks like as it crosses seams. A project file for this is available on Gumroad. To get that, check the link below. We'll make extensive use of Node Wrangler, so let's make sure that's turned on. You'll find it in Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, Node Wrangler. It is on. We'll need a curve to form as a basis of our wall, so let's create that now. I'm not a fan of the starting Bezier, so let's give it some more interesting points. Delete all those vertices. Go to the Draw Brush. That should work nicely. Now let's give ourselves some geometry nodes. Let's turn the curve into a wall. For the profile curve, we'll use a quadrilateral. It doesn't have to be a quad, but we'll just keep things simple for now. Let's give it some reasonable values to start. I want the shape to be under the control of the user, so let's provide some inputs for that now. Drag this out into an empty space and select Group Input. That will create a new variable under the Group tab, which will also be visible under the Attributes for Geometry nodes. Frequently I change this name, but Width is a perfectly good name for it. Do the same thing with Height. I want my wall to sit where the original curve was, so let's move it up by half its height. There, now I'll be able to sleep tonight. It's important that we also gain control over the amount of points along the original curve, so let's resample it. And I want this to be under user control as well. And that's it for the wall construction. Now we need to create a rectangular object that does the same thing. It will be identical to this one. Let's join this up temporarily so we can see what we're doing. 
we do not want this geometry input. What we do want is just a curved line. And I'm going to have this run from minus 10 to plus 10 on the x. It doesn't have to be plus 10 to minus 10, but later on we're going to have a test to see whether an edge is at the end of the wall, and we're going to test against this value here. So the only thing that's important is that test needs to match these values. Now let's do just a little bit of tidying. In order to UV unwrap the wall, we need to tell it where the seams are. To do that, we'll need a Boolean equation to tell it which edges are the seams. Let's take care of that now. So the seams we want are the edges that run the length of the wall and the edges at both ends of the wall. Let's start with the ends of the wall. Grab the position. We'll only need the x value. We'll take the absolute value of x. That will allow us to deal with both ends of the wall at the same time. And we'll compare to 10, which is the value we set here as the beginning and ending point of the wall. So this should select eight edges that comprise both ends of the wall. Now let's get the points that run along the wall. Grab an edge vertices node. By subtracting the endpoints of the edge, we get a vector that describes the direction of the edge. In this case, we're interested in any vector that has a non-zero x component. So not equal to zero is good enough. Both of these tests should select the edges we want to provide for the seams. But let's just go ahead and check that real quick. If I delete all the edges that are not this, this will leave us the edges that we're using as the seams. And you can see that's exactly what we want. We want the ends. We want the edges running lengthwise and nothing else. And we just got it. Back up a little bit. Now we have all the information we need to do the UV unwrap. This will be our seam. And while we're here, let's go ahead and provide the controls to scale this. We'll create a group input for the U scaling and the V scaling. Just drag this out into space and select group input. And again, and we'll change these names to make them more meaningful. Start them off as with one for the value. And it doesn't make much sense for them to go negative. Now we have the information we need to UV unwrap this rectangular object. Because everything we did up here, all the selection criteria, only works on the rectangular object. These tests would fail on the curved object which is the whole point of we created this rectangular object. The problem is we will get the UV map for the rectangular object, which is ultimately what we don't want. But what we can do is transfer the UV map to the curve with the sample index node. Now to do this in 3.3 and 3.2, you will need to use the transfer attribute node. It works just the same. I've tried it, it's great. What this will do is it will take information from the rectangle geometry and copy it over to the curve geometry. So what we want is vectors, because that's what we're dealing with. It has to be the face corner domain, because UV maps only work when they're in the face corner domain. And to put the data into the geometry for the curve, we use a store named attribute call this UV unwrap. We'll be storing vectors. And again, it has to be the face corner domain. And we'll plug that in. And the data we'll be storing is the UV map. Let's grab a texture to see if this all works. Shift F1 a couple times to bring up my asset library. I'm going to use the floor clinkers texture from Polyhaven. That's linked in the description. It's free. Now go back to geometry nodes. We will set this as our texture. 
floor crankers. Now this doesn't look great right now because we're not currently using the UV data that we generated. Let's go to the shader editor and set that up. To summon the UV map, we'll use an attribute node. Give it the name that we assigned it back in the star named attribute and hook it into the vector input of the mapping. And it worked. Go back to geometry notes. Now the rotation and scaling are not all that we would want at this point, but you can see we have already achieved success when it comes to the texture following the top of the wall. Now, as I showed in the intro, I want to be able to give control over each of the faces, front and back, top and bottom, and the ends. In order to do that, we need to tell them apart. Let's handle that right now. We'll use a sample index again. I want vectors. This time I want them from the face domain. Basically what we're going to do is use whether the vectors are pointing out along the X, pointing along the Y, or pointing along the Z to tell which face we're dealing with. Now, it wouldn't work well at all on this curved wall, but we're not going to use the curved wall we're going to use the rectangular wall where everything is pointing in nice and simple directions. And we'll just grab the normal off of each face. Couldn't be easier. Call that face normal. Now we'll use this value in the context of the curved wall to apply different textures to different faces. And this won't do us any good in the point domain. It needs to be the face. I want to provide the opportunity to select different textures for the sides of the wall, the ends of the wall, and the top and the bottom. And I want to put those in the user interface. Let's do that now. Create a material. And two more. And we'll set those materials here and these will come from the interface. Now there's another way we could go about this. In the texture, you could have attributes for rotation and scale for each of the textures. So that would be three inputs for the top and bottom, three inputs for the front and back, three inputs for the ends. What that would allow you to do is have one texture that you use across all of these geometry nodes. It turns into a lot of noodle soup. And I'm not sure it's that much more flexible. So I'm just going to do it this way. It's much simpler to implement, and I also think it's easier to understand and use. I'm going to let the default texture be the top of the wall. To select the sides, we're just going to select all the face normals that go along the y-axis. Now, of course, for the curved surface, this wouldn't work at all. But we copied over the face normals from the rectangular wall, and there the normals are very simple, and we can make these simple choices. Grab the face normal. And we're interested if the y is non-zero, then we are, then we have one of these faces, which I'm calling sides. If the x is non-zero, then we have one of the ends. Now I want to give us three different textures to use here. So let's go into the shader editor. I'm going to make one of these unique and call it top. Make another one unique. Call it sides. Make another one unique. Call it ends. Now if we've done our jobs correctly, I can select the one for sides and adjust it. And you can see when we adjust this, only the side texture is affected. One of the things I for sure want to do while I'm here is rotate it. And I notice at this point that we didn't actually give ourselves ends. That's because I didn't check the fill-in cap. That's 
Let's go ahead and make this thing look all pretty. I think that'll do for demo purposes. The one thing I want to do before quitting is deal with circularity. So let's create a circular version of this. And give this the same geometry node set. Now, one thing you can notice although it's not so easy on this texture, is this section right here is not textured. That's because when you have a linear wall with the same number of samples as a curved wall, you lack the one extra step that takes you from the end back to the beginning. We can fix this of one of two ways. We could add one to the rectilinear wall, or we could subtract one sample from the curved wall. It's easier to subtract one sample from the curved wall. There's a test called is spline cyclic that will return true if you're dealing with a circle. So what we've done is if this thing is cyclic, the switch statement will evaluate to 1, and we will subtract 1 from the number of samples. If the switch statement is false, then we subtract 0 from the number of samples. That allows both the line and the circle case to work. Now, I'll tell you that cyclic is 0 for false and 1 for true, and we could directly subtract that value if we wanted to. But as a longtime programmer, counting on the value of a boolean to be any specific value other than zero and not zero, just, I cannot do it. Like I said, you can usually do a pretty good job of getting the texture to look decent by only messing with the U and the V. Changing the individual textures, more of a special case. I think we've done a pretty good job here. I have a deep affection for generating walls, road, paths, and the like out of individual stones, each one generated randomly, textured, and carefully placed. Sometimes, however, this is just too much geometry for a scene. That's when low-poly solutions like this one really shine. It's also easier to get a richer variety of appearance when you let textures do the heavy lifting. The project file for this, including 2D solutions, is available on Gumroad. Check out the link below. If you want to see the 2D UV unwrapping video that this one was based on, check out the video on the left. If you want to learn how to procedurally apply strings to curves, check out the video on the right. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it.